Welcome. Welcome to this grand Budapest hotel. Just like in the movie, it promises quite an adventure. And to this grand city, Budapest, formed from the merger of Buda and Pest, with compromise and common venture in its soul. Astride the river Danube, this was a center of humanist culture, Celtic, Roman, Ottoman, home to the Bibliotheca Corviniana, source of the liberal uprisings of 1848 and 1956. This city should be a center of learning and exploration, of openness and tolerance. It should nurture talent and technology. That was the vision of Arpad Gunks, a president whose recent death we much regret. Instead, instead of that, it is the capital of a country under a man who boasts of building an illiberal state. Liberal Democrats recognized years ago that Orban is no liberal. The European People's Party should have seen by now that he is no Democrat. His influence in their ranks is growing, and that tells us so much about the EPP. Did you follow their Congress recently in Madrid, where speaker after speaker came closer to Orban than to Merkel? I am proud that among us today are people who resist his abuse of political power. Gabor Fodor of Liberalisop, Souza Zelenyi of Egyut, Zoltan Kesh, the winner of this year's by-election in Vesprem, whose victory robbed Orban of the two-thirds majority that can change the Constitution. <laughs> Friends, we salute you. Because we know, we know where the illiberal state leads. To the murder of our friend Boris Nemtsov and the arrest of Sergei Mitrokin. To the detention and bankrupting of the followers of Fethullah Gulen who dare to criticize Erdogan. To the jailing of liberals in Baku and the beating of Aram Manukyan in Yerevan. That road leads back to the horrors of the past. Here in Europe today, we do not lack the tools to deal with those who break the rule of law in the European Convention on Human Rights and in the treaties of the European Union. What we lack is a cross-party commitment to the rule of law. Where the liberal state is threatened from within, there is no excuse for Europe's failure to act. And of course, the liberal state is also threatened from outwith, from fanatics who see the attraction of our way of life and who hate us for it. Prepared to stop at nothing, in Baghdad, Beirut, or Paris, to destroy the liberal way. In 2001, they hit the symbol of America's success, money. Last week, they hit the symbol of our success, a tolerant society. The people murdered in Paris were young civilians enjoying an evening out, gunned down in cold blood for enjoying the fruits of the liberal way of life. There are lessons to be learned from the American-led war on terror. In the hope of helping democracy, our bombing created chaos, and now they export the chaos rather than importing the democracy. We blew our peace dividend in a 20-year party of spend, spend, spend. We got 
a financial hangover, they get the geopolitical wasteland. Bush and Blair played into the hands of Al-Qaeda by invading Iraq and Afghanistan. Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib became the best recruiting sergeants for ISIS. The extrajudicial killings of bin Laden and Mwazi and others diminish us and strengthen them. But whatever the mistakes that were made, one fact remains. The attacks on Paris are a crime against humanity. The perpetrators should go to the International Criminal Court, not to a martyr's grave. The only way, the only way to fight fanaticism is from the moral high ground. Respecting and using international law. Offering sanctuary to those in need. Earning respect of those who doubt. And learning from America's mistakes that it needs much more than military might. There are two ways. There are two ways to react to the challenge we face. To unite in a common front against a common threat, or to seek solace in the old certainties at the atavistic altars of nationalism and religion. Where those two ways meet is called Cameron's Corner. The UK is to vote on its road ahead. Liberals know which road we choose. And to borrow from the poet Robert Frost, it is the road less traveled by and it will make all the difference. We face supranational challenges which need supranational answers a global politics for a global age. So we have to step up cooperation between intelligence services, police forces, judiciaries. We must unite in a common purpose to enforce the rule of law, not have the criminal halfway around the world while the bobby is still getting his boots on. We must welcome refugees with resolve and readiness, with preparation and purpose, open hearts and open minds not shut out those who flee from the very same monster that we face. Work with them. As a liberal America worked with our refugees 100 years ago to build a continent which is truly great. That is the answer to the nationalists and the naysayers. That is the wellspring of fresh blood and new ideas for our economy. And it is the best reminder to Hungary that when 200,000 needed shelter 60 years ago, we did not let them down. I, I don't seek to deny or to belittle the very serious challenges posed by the refugee influx today. Solidarity will be essential. It is disgraceful of Viktor Orban to say that quotas are about distributing terrorists. But I do not accept for one moment that Europe cannot cope. We can cope and we can expose the hatred inherent in the rantings of the racists and the populists and we can still win elections, as we did in Finland, in Denmark, in Estonia, as we will do elsewhere, giving the European Union seven liberal prime ministers, more than in 40 years. There may soon be more liberals in the European Council than EPP or socialists. Let us use that success to manage better our global affairs. Overseas aid is stretched to breaking point. 80 million people are in need and 60 million are displaced. And despite record donations, care agencies cannot cope. So let us use the World Humanitarian Summit next May to make life tolerable for all human beings, to defend the dignity 
of the downtrodden and the displaced, to raise life standards to the point where population plateaus. Climate change causing havoc with water. And you can sum it up in eight words. Too much, too little, wrong time, wrong place. Some of those seeking our shores are subsistence farmers no longer able to grow the crops they need to live. So let us commit in Paris next month to a long-term framework to manage it. Our economy is in a rut. Let us grasp the ideas of a low-carbon, resource-efficient, circular economy, not just because it's morally right, but because it makes us more competitive. Adam Smith would have argued for it, and so should we. You know, together there is very little that we cannot do when we decide to. And just as Europe can be a force for good globally, so too it can work its magic locally. We built peace between Serbia and Kosovo. Sadly, not between the Kosovars themselves. We can do the same in Cyprus. We spawned a single market and a common currency. We can now back the innovators and the entrepreneurs to take it to its heights. We banned discrimination on any grounds. We can now improve the workings of the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. Humankind has the power to break the chains of history. But we will not do so unless we work at it and fellow liberals, we have a huge task ahead. Einstein observed that only two things in life are infinite, the universe and man's stupidity. And he added, I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> man's stupidity threatens to bring down the European Union. Failure to educate our people about the new global challenges they face. Failure to forge a competitive continental economy. Failure to make our democracy fit for purpose. And against the hurricane of events, we may be torn apart. Friends, we have tremendous intellectual horsepower in this hall. Let us harness it to the creation of a just and stable Europe. Let us create what Winston Churchill called a wider patriotism and a common citizenship for the distraught peoples of this powerful and turbulent continent.